Uh, well, good evening. I think I've said good evening to everyone. Um, teaching the police the program. I think I wanted to try and come up with something that um, kind of captured uh, the foolhardiness of, of what we try to do, essentially. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are teachers and how many of you are, are students or have been students, um, but um, programming tends to be one of the hardest things you can you can try to teach someone, um, and quite often the police officer was pl police officers were involved with um, investigations and computer forensics, any kind of um, computer investigations. Uh, quite often have not had any formal um, uh, computer education either, so. Um, it can be quite tough. They're usually quite gifted with computers and that's why they've ended up where they are. Um, although hopefully that's changing. There are a lot more programs now where um, there are um, uh, teaching um, our students to go out and look for these forensics and security jobs, obviously. Um, so I want to start off by just kind of talking about the, um, the reason that we wanted to, to start doing um, uh, teaching the police the program. Um, the data storage size implications, uh, I had a student a, a couple of years ago who worked for Essex Police who came up with this way of looking at it. Um, and I quite liked the way that he'd done this um, because this is a, quite a nice picture that I took of Bath. Um, uh, I, I think it is quite nice. Do you agree? You can, you can comment on my photographic prowess if you like. Um, but um, it's just some woman spoiling it in the bottom there, but we'll, we'll not worry too much about that. Um, so this is about 100k, okay? Um, and there are some older faces who may remember the floppy disk, and we can get 14 copies on there, okay? Um, but obviously if we're storing something like documents, if you were going to store just characters, 12 font, uh, 12 point font, then we've got two inches of paper, which is obviously quite a lot to go through. Um, as we get bigger with our memory cards, um, we've got 256 meg. I, I, I don't think, I think the one, first one I ever bought was 128. Um, and now it's quite expensive. I think, I think I'll probably get four of them now for the, the price I paid for 128. Um, but we've got 2,500, uh, 2560 copies of my bath image that would be likely to go on there. And we're up to 30 feet of paper, 450 paperbacks. Okay. And it goes on, obviously, as we get more and more involved, um, with our storage media, we can store much more stuff. So there is a problem with dealing with all of this data. Um, even our older netbook, we're talking 800,000 copies um, of the bath image. If we're talking about something like um, uh, indecent images of children, uh, investigations involving those, for example, uh, it doesn't have to be that. Obviously, it, this is where some of the, um, the paperback stats might come into it if you're talking about financial fraud and things like that. Um, so... The punchline, I guess, is that if we're going to have a look at that, um, 80 gig hard drive, we've got 27.4 years to do. We obviously need to do something about, about that. That is not a, a realistic way of doing anything. Okay. Um, and most computers will have at least 250. I, I don't think you could probably even buy a 250 now. Um, but let's say 250, um, and obviously that is going to take even longer. Um, I'm sure you all saw this story with uh, the lost property in Watkins, and I think he had 27 gig, uh, 20, 27 terabytes, sorry, of um, 27 terabytes of storage, which according to the, the BBC website here, was almost five times the size of the police force that arrested him. So, you know, having to deal with that was obviously a, a major challenge. And they also, because I think 
probably because it was such a big, high-profile case, they did get GCHQ involved in finding the password and um, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the data storage implications are obviously a big, big problem, okay? And so what we quite often do is we, we have a number of tools. When, when we start getting our students doing stuff, when we start getting our um, students to start to find things, we do it on very small images. We do it with, um, uh, um, by hand. So we, we will actually get them to have a look through a hex dump and then try and find, you know, the start of a JPEG and the end of a JPEG and those kind of things. Um, so that they know what the tools are doing. But quite often, uh, you know, for a real investigation, you are going to have to use these tools. So NCASE and FTK TK are probably the two biggest proprietary tools that are out there. Um, the examinations with these tools uh, still take several weeks or months, okay? So it takes an awfully long time. Um, we had a, a while ago, we were trying to find out how much time this takes. We were, we'd, we'd heard from all of our colleagues who work in the police. We'd heard that they, 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 it was taking, you know, they've got six month, 12 month, 18 month backlogs, but there was nowhere that was actually telling us that data was, was true. So, we, you know, we, we were getting told this, but we weren't sure it was true. So we tried to, um, we tried to do some work to look at that and we did some Freedom of Information Act requests to find out how long it was taking people. Um, but all we found out from our Freedom of Information Act requests is that we need to frame our questions better, okay? Um, that is what we learned about, about it. Because, uh, take for example this, we, we were actually looking at this because we were looking at a live data forensics approach. So a live data forensics approach would be for, um, you know, if you've got encryption, one of the easiest ways to get an encrypted drive is if the person is logged on and you can actually make a copy while they're logged on to the encrypted drive. So that might be one reason why you might use live data forensics. So we were asking about, you know, um, encryption in particular here. And we asked Kent Police, you know, how, how long on average does it, uh, 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 an examination take? And they came back and told us 52.69 days, which was quite precise. And they told us, you know, all cases closed. So uh, in January 2011, 52.69 days, which we thought, okay, we should have been more precise. I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. And that showed with some of the other responses so Surrey, unable to give a figure for the turnaround from seizure to presentation in court. Um, Hampshire, all cases in the last 12 months relating full in, in, encryption, still under investigation. Therefore, Hampshire Constabulary does not hold the information you were seeking. So they said they didn't know, um, but they also focused in on the encryption stuff that we, were, that we were looking at as an overarching thing and said, we haven't done anything with them in the last 12 months. So it kind of suggested there may be a backlog, but still not entirely sure. And then Metropolitan Police were my favorite because they just came back and said, this would stop us from doing our job. So we're not gonna tell you, yeah? Uh, if, we told, if we told everyone who asked, you know, it took six months to do a case, We'd never get anything done. You know, criminals be laughing in our face. They'll be encrypting everything um, and so on. Um, so one of the ways that we can start to um, look at this problem of the immense amount of data is with triage. Um, and it comes from, I think, the First World War, where they were trying to decide, you know, which patients should get medical attention. Um, and you can see here that, you know, the first priority are people that they can really save and they can get them back out onto the, on, onto the battlefield. Second priority, you can delay them. They're, they're not in too bad shape, you can, you, but you, they, you need to come back to them pretty quickly. Minor injuries, they need some treatment, but they, we can leave that till much later. And then obviously morgue, which may or may not mean they were dead, yeah? Um, but certainly, uh, 
this kind of thing. And, and obviously for that, a lot of our tools do a lot of those jobs like known good, bad, uh, good lists, known bad lists of files. So you can find all of those. It can look for what looks like encryption or compression. Um, so, you know, worthy of, of, of more investigation. Um, file signature and extension mismatch things. Obviously, it does those kind of things uh, really easily. Keyword searching. Um, and one of the, the tools that um, ECTEG is the um, uh, European Cybercrime Training and Education Group, which comes under a Europol umbre umbrella, um, they, they have started using something called Deep Thought, which is based on a uh, Linux script, basically. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Kane distribution, um, which is a, um, uh, a live distribution with all the forensic tools and security tools you might, you might wish for on there. And he wrote a script to go along with that. The guy who wrote it used to work for Warwickshire Police, and he wrote it because he did have a backlog and he wanted to do something that wasn't just triage because the problem with triage is that um, if you just use your tools, uh, quite often people call it kind of Nintendo forensics where they kind of are pressing the buttons but they don't really understand exactly what everything's doing and they're missing a lot of stuff. So an example would be um, that in a child abuse case, for example, um, they can say, yes, this is a child abuse image, but they might miss the fact that it is uh, a live abuse image, so it's something that they were taking part in as well. And so obviously that would be much more urgent to try and sort that out because it would be happening to a child possibly at the time. So something like that might be um, uh, a problem. Uh, so what he wanted to do is he, want, he basically wanted to do something that he calls enhanced preview. He doesn't like triage because the problem with it is that you kind of only catch the rubbish criminals, if you, if you want to put it that way. Okay, You only get the low-hanging fruit. You only get the guys who don't use encryption and uh, you know, are not using anonymous proxies and not doing a number of things to try and hide their activity. Um, and using scripting, he was able to do that. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to pass on some of that knowledge because um, it wouldn't necessarily be good enough with things changing as they do. It wouldn't necessarily be good enough just to give them a script and get on with it. You've still got just a Nintendo forensics guy in the end, you know, albeit with a script. Um, you've just got someone doing some stuff with a, a, a script. So we wanted people to understand what they were doing with scripting. And um, I cheated a bit with the title, really, because it was uh, the culmination, I would say, of probably a 10-year um, program, um, where, which was looking at the harmonization of computer forensic investigation training. And uh, I think in about 2000, 2001, the Falcone project, these are funding streams, European Union funding streams, incidentally. Um, Falcone, a stream of funding, um, they funded a project where law enforcement trainers and academics uh, and ind industry professionals got together and said, look, there, there are lots of things that we'll be duplicating. There's lots of things that we'll be doing differently. Let's get together and try and work together a bit more closely so that we can um, have a, a program of study that we that we're all following, we're all following the same kinds of procedures. Let's not have this fragmentation that's going on. Let's not have the duplication of effort. Um, so what they did is they uh, got some more funding from the Aegis stream of funding, and they created some courses at postgraduate level. So what they wanted to do is they didn't want to just create a training program. There's been quite a lot of stuff about um, training programs uh, and education and, you know, are they compatible? I think they are. I think that you can do both. Um, but um, they agreed, essentially. They, they were saying, look, we want academics involved in this, but we're going to have trainers involved and they're going to work together to produce a program that's useful and is accredited. Okay? Um, because when those guys go and stand in the dock and give their evidence, they wanted to be able to say, this guy's also qualified. This guy's also an expert. 
Um, and then eventually with the ISEC stream of funding, um, the courses were developed into an MSc programme which was validated by University College Dublin. Okay. Um, so it's funded mostly through those funding streams through the European Commission. Um, but the Garda, the Irish Garda, played a big part in it. Um, the National Policing Improvement Agency, which the part that was doing this has now become uh, the College of Policing. Okay, um, And we still work with the College of Policing. We run a, a, a master's with them which um, accredits their training courses. We, we've tacked on loads of stuff around it and we do some courses ourselves and the project ourselves um, so that it runs um, with them. Uh, it's only open to law enforcement though, that one. Um, and then if you can pronounce that, I'm going to say LAFP, okay? But you feel free to pronounce away. Um, uh, but those guys were the ones who, who largely funded this, okay? Uh, but there were a number of partners from across Europe and around the world. So we had um, uh, lots of countries and universities represented. So University College Dublin, uh, Canby Christchurch University, and Troyes in France as the universities. Um, we had states or potential member states um, involved. But also wider internationally, we had the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and we had uh, Interpol and Europol and um, CPOL, the police college uh, in Europe as well. So they were all working together. We were all working together to try and produce this program. Okay. Um, and, and the thing is, is that the, these, these programs are developed and then they sit with Europol and then police forces from around the world can request these courses as well. So they can kind of get them off the shelf to get their program started. So, um, I don't know, a lot of the um, uh, African continent and uh, the Indian subcontinent, they've requested these so they can try and get their stuff started as well. Um, so what did it look like? It looked like this. We had an introductory IT uh, forensics and network forensic investigation was the was first thing we did. Added a few more courses. Christchurch was involved from the beginning, but I only got involved from the Linux as an investigative tool part, uh, where I was the, the lead trainer for that. Um, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm going to go. I'll, I'll show you the, the rest of what we did. Forensic scripting using Bash. So I did cheat a little bit teaching the police to program because they will have already done some Linux. Okay, that was the, 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 the bit I left out of my title, really. Yeah, sorry, I cheated. Okay. Um, what was, what was good, though, is all the seven courses I just showed you previously on the previous slide is they were all funded by Microsoft. So we did have a Microsoft Linux course, yeah, which I thought was really nice. Um, and we even had CDs with Microsoft because they'd funded the upgrades. We had, we had CDs with Microsoft Linux on it. Um, uh, so we updated the seven courses. We had three courses that we were piloting, and then we were going to run all 10 of them with other stuff added on to make it an MSc. Okay, so that was the, it was a three-year project. It was 2008 to 2000 and, uh, uh, and 2011, um, and that's what we did. Um, how did I decide on those courses? What, what did we do to decide on those courses? Uh, well, we did this. Uh, there were a big bunch of people in the room. They all came with their own agendas. They all came with their own ideas. Um, quite often they would come and they'd have um, the same ideas, actually, because they were having the same problems. Um, and they'd come along and uh, the law enforcement, the academics, the industry professionals, they all come along with their suggested course titles, their discussions, their presentations, and so on, and say, this is what I've got, this is, this is what I'd like to do. They'd have a little chat about it, they'd perhaps present something saying why we think this is a good idea and so on. And then it was just a vote. It wasn't like, a, you know, it was a strange way of think, getting things done, but it was a good way of getting things done because the people in the room just voted for the courses they, they felt should be developed. And that was the way the courses kind of developed. It was a, a vote. If you're in the room, you've got to vote. <laughs> um, um, and then, obviously, we've got the courses to be developed. 
once we've got those courses to be developed, we had to actually develop them. Um, and it wasn't just a case of going, Paul, you're an academic, you go off and develop the course. Um, it was a case of um, getting together a bunch of experts, trainers and course developers together and actually trying to get them to produce something that was relevant to industry, relevant to law enforcement, um, and also um, academically sound as well. So this, this kind of Lego picture, if you like, up here, we all came along with kind of our own bits that we thought this would fit really well. Look, what, what about this for a syllabus, suggestions, and we took bits of them. Okay, my, not quite as neat as that, I'll just add, but that's what we did initially. We had, we had those kind of um, uh, different bits from different courses, different ideas from different people. Sometimes there, was no, there were no materials, so they were to be developed, but they, they said, look, this is really important to do this stuff. Um, then we split that up, um, and we split it up so that there was a trainer, who was responsible for it, and there was a seconder. The reason we had a seconder is what we found after we ran a few pilots of some of the other courses, we found that um, although there were always five trainers in the room, four or five trainers in the room, uh, there was only usually one guy who really knew what he was talking about. So what we did is we made sure that there were at least two people in the room who knew what they were talking about because they, they were responsible. And also if anyone got sick or too drunk or whatever, the night before, they were able to, you know, have someone to step in. Uh, not that not there was any drinking going on, doing this sort of thing. Um, once those things have been developed, the course designer and uh, me got together and um, made a coherent timetable and had something that would work for the week and would work with the, the materials that everyone had developed. Um, and then we obviously introduced our students. Uh, they either passed or failed, and some of them did unfortunately fail. Um, and then they evaluated the course, we evaluated the course, and that fed into the next time it, it ran. Okay. Um, so as I say, we would pilot something first, then we would run it as part of the MSc, is the way that this usually worked. What did it look like? Um, the Linux is an investigative tool course uh, looked like this. It, it was initially uh, a one week course, but we nearly killed the people who went on it for, for a week. Um, we, we did it in the uh, Garda College at Templemore in Ireland. And um, whilst they were very long days for the students, very long days for the trainers, and we got most of them through. I think they were, they were one or two fails that we had there um, initially when we ran it. Um, but we decided after that, that actually Linux takes a bit of time to sink in. We're gonna need to ha do something a little bit different. And it was decided it should be really run over two weeks. So the first week uh, we would essentially do just a basic Linux course, but with a bent, with a, the context being that we would um, uh, be looking at as much as possible, forensic applications. Yeah, so pushing towards forensic stuff. Although, obviously, a lot of the stuff we did, you know, there was a the lot of the normal, everyday things you have to do in the command line uh, of Linux on, on those courses. Um, the second week, though, and this was the kind of second half of the week initially, was where we really did some uh, forensics. And we had a case study. Um, and the case study was basically, I think, uh, uh, a bomb threat was sent uh, via email. And then we got students to find the bomb threat. And there were several uh, machines involved. There was a uh, half-shredded proxy server that we used um, with logs on there so that we could try and then link that to Peter Target, who ended up being our suspect. Um, where he had a, a Windows XP machine. And also then there was a, um, uh, a pen drive which used NTFS encryption, um, which was plugged into the, um, the, the hard drive. Um, 
And so we were able to look at forensic file formats, searching, gathering information, keyword searching, all the different tools that are available to us uh, in Linux. We were able to get those things um, going. Um, and then we did start doing some script basics with them. Um, not a huge amount, but we did a little bit with them. Um, and then the culmination of that was that we ran the um, uh, we ran the Windows XP machine uh, in a virtual machine. We used QEMU uh, to run the virtual machine, um, and uh, we used things like Open Gates. I don't know if you've heard of Open Gates, and uh, where, where you can kind of get around some of the asking for the you know the Microsoft genuine advantage. I don't know who it's a genuine advantage for, but it's for someone. Yeah, but you, you can get around some of that stuff with it. Um, and we were able to look at the encrypted files as well. So that was, that was kind of our punchline is that we can look at the encrypted files by using um, a virtual machine and uh, we used off crack to crack the passwords as well. Um, so the first week in the end became an online element because we'd already bid for funding and we couldn't do anything about it. So it became um, an online element. And um, it also meant that it was kind of a pilot for all of these other courses going online eventually. Okay. Um, In terms of the issues that we had, the development team were truly international. They were, so there was, there was me, there was a guy from Warwickshire Police, a uh, guy from the Dutch National Police uh, Service. There was a, um, two guys from Belgium, uh, a guy from Germany. So there were quite a, a lot of different nations and different places. And we didn't have the funding to all get together all the time and, you know, really have jollies um, to, you know, kind of get together. So a lot of it had to be done via Moodle and via email and Skype and whatever else. Um, English skills weren't as big a problem as I thought they might be, um, but they were something that we kept in mind the entire time. Um, and we had quite a lot of online support for hardware and software difficulties for the students who were getting used to Linux as well. Um, the content of the course proved the most difficult, though, uh, because it was really difficult to teach it. Um, and Linux just doesn't work in quite the way that the Windows user expects. Command line interface is quite a steep learning curve as well. We evaluated and we evaluated using the Kirk, uh, Kirkpatrick model. Um, and so we handed out happy sheets after each session. Um, and said, what did you think of that? Where, where, did we lose you? Um, how can we improve this? All of those kind of things. Um, the learning, we looked at student assessment. And for some of them, we had um, tests at the beginning as well to see you know, what they really knew when they coming in as well, as well as when they were going out. Um, and then we also had behav behavioral kind of um, results as well, where they did learning journals throughout and afterwards. And we also got manager's feedback because all the people doing this were serving police officers. Um, and it was all pretty good. You can see the very poor and poor um, feedback. Generally, the aggregate feedback, at least, was um, pretty good. But it was usually because the students and the, and the staff were working quite hard to make it work. Um, it wasn't ideal, I would say, to, uh, you know, do the stuff online, do it in a week. I think we would have preferred longer, but we had the constraints of the funding that we had. Um, two students out of the 28 that sat the course, failed the final assessment. Overall, the student average was 80%, all passed on, eight, on, on reset. So, um, so training kind of marks, uh, it's not usual for us to get those kind of marks. I would say probably an average of 80 for our students on a, a you know, an MSE course, but the marks there are kind of indicative of kind of the training test bit. Um, and they, they went away and used it, which was nice. They went away and, and found that it was easier than using the tools that they'd been using. 
they found that it was easier than uh, than anything else they'd been using. They found that they had this little script that they could go away and use. They could. They found that they, you know, because even some of the stuff on the Linux course initially was like a script because it was, you know, piped and and things. And so they were able to do some stuff from that. Um, converting images, they found. I, th I think they found was was quite often. Um, easier and quicker once they once they were into the swing of it they were they were happier doing several things in there and even things like extracting the metadata i think they could get it much easier than than exporting from something like encase or something like that they got it in plain text they could put it into a file they could get it out nice and easily um, so the forensic scripting using bash so Scripting, we wanted to stick with scripting. We wanted to call it scripting because we didn't want to frighten people off with by calling it programming. Um, and we went with Bash because they had already done some Bash with the Linux course. And a lot of people will have done some Bash. A lot of people who have been around computers for a while will have done um, some Bash. Um, and we didn't want to scare someone off by having something that was more efficient and better like Perl because that really does scare the pants off people when you start getting people doing some Perl. Um, I think University College Dublin now have moved with their courses to using Python. So there's a, you know, they obviously think that that's the way to go. Um, but for our course that we do run with um, um, the College of Policing and our forensic program, we still use Bash. Um, um, and the first, we, we tried to, to do this as if it was a, um, a training course that you'd do for um, a scripting, normal scripting course. And we had sort of two and a half days-ish, three days-ish of what we called kind of normal bash scripting. So we did sequence selection, iteration, uh, variables, um, and that kind of stuff. But we, had, we tried to do it on the third day with specific forensic applications. Um, on the Thursday, we wanted to talk a little bit about user interface and improving the output. So, uh, improving the user interface, we used um, dialogues. So we used Zenity to try and improve the, the uh, input because um, I think they kind of got a little bit sick of kind of trying to type in past names and put dates and all that kind of. Is it, do I use a slash or a dash or whatever? And what we found is if you just use dialogues for those things, it was much easier to go and get a, I want, I want this file and I want this date and I want this. So that improved, um, you know, uh, error checking kind of stuff as well. And, and the output, we got them to do a little bit, just a little bit of HTML. So we could say, you can start to format this. Um, and we got them to build what I, I call a mini autopsy. I don't know if you've used autopsy as a, as a tool, but we got them to build a mini one where it, it basically got images and you had links that you could click on for, for those images. Um, and we also had a number of other different things. One of the things that we did in here was we did a, a web spider, um, which allowed um, our investigators basically to run a little cron job every so often to check websites. Uh, use wget just to get the website and then used hashes just to match up what had changed on that website since a, a specific date. So you might run it once a day and you just get the files that have changed basically is what it did. Um, we also did a Beyond Bash, which, which didn't go down well. That's where we did talk to them a, a, bit, a little bit about Perl and Python and things, and, and they didn't like that at all. Um, the poor, I think, was for the Beyond Bash. I think, that, I think they'd had the test, they had an assessment, and then they just wanted to go home and be left alone and sit in a dark room. Um, and, and actually... Um, we gave them another lecture afterwards to kind of go, this is what you do next. And they just didn't, they, I just want to do this next and go away. Um, so that was for the pilot. Um, one third of the students failed, but we gave a pre-course assessment to make sure that they knew Linux before. And uh, five of them didn't, <laughs> didn't really know Linux before they came on it. Um, so um, it was indicative. We couldn't say, because it was, it was, they were kind of anonymous, 
both you know the the the, the results that we got in the end were, were were anonymous we did it just on anonymous results we couldn't say the five that failed initially with the you know the people who failed afterwards um but it was indicative is what we said um the pre-course assessment was therefore indicative of the number uh, overall the student average was 58 so looking a bit more like kind of our msc kind of thing um but it was still a training course so it was a little bit low actually um so the msc run so that was the pilot the msc run um we changed the the what we collected um uh, in terms of fully mostly partially not at all for the structure and the method of delivery we wanted a bit more information we ran it again um and then the student understanding and we were quite happy with that i mean there were there was some stuff that was really quite difficult the web spider stuff was although it was only half a page of code there was quite a lot in there um some students concerned about the difficulty of subject matter so with note and trainers put a lot of work in outside of the classroom so working through the exercise in the evening is very beneficial as is the availability of trainers for that time much appreciated we were just in the bar and they came and saw us basically um that was that was where our office was um for the msc run five out of the 28 failed bearing in mind that those guys had done the friend the friend um uh um, Linux as an investigative tool course. Um, the overall student average for the test was 68%. All students passed the other 50%. Out, uh, so we gave them an assignment as well because this is an MSc. We also gave them an assignment to do, I don't know, two months in the future and said, you know, go away and do this assignment. And the average mark for the assignment was 78. Um, in terms of the behavior and results, the stuff afterwards, the managers were contacted, I think a year or 18 months afterwards and asked what was going on. But they'd said, you know, uh, one of them had said, for example, has also developed different useful forensic tools and software packages that are used by all members of the unit. So they had gone off and used some of this and, and maybe just taken some of the stuff and tweaked it. But that was kind of really what we were intending for them to do. Um, the web spider we've learned is incredibly valuable for our work of monitoring websites because not all of them were forensic guys some of them were investigators as well so it is, it is a, um, a mix there we were highly surprised when we saw how easy it is with a non very long script sick um, uh, to have a real-time monitoring display system to display all the changes in the website um, and then this was quite nice as well. They, they'd come back and said, from confidence point of view, the last few Linux months, and in particular the scripting course, post-course assignment haven't proven to be invaluable. Over the last three years, I've been constantly mindful of the expertise that surrounds me, the knowledge that my colleagues have acquired over many years of hard work, of which I feel I can only ever aspire to. Having completed my script, I was asked by two of the most experienced colleagues if I would provide them with a copy of my script as they wish to look at it and learn for it. I'm still in shock that I'm seen as somewhat of a relative expert on this subject. So it was really nice that they, they had really done. And, and I'm not just cherry picking that there were a lot of things that, that, that were like this, but I am cherry picking, but you know what I mean. Um, so um, in terms of what we did, I think it was uh, a unique development and delivery. I think essentially we, we really liked um, the fact that we were combining the training and the education elements. Um, but I think we still would have liked a bit more time. I, I'm not sure that running in a week is the ideal w way of doing things, but you know, it's certainly the norm for training courses, I would say. Um, Management development me me models. So our way of, uh, I think our way of deciding, just having the vote, coming along with our materials, putting together the, 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 the materials, I think could work for other kind of wider um, uh, um, developments like this. So, you know, I don't know, medical or legal developments, things like that could be used for that, those kind of things. Because those are things that quite, we kind of learned as we went along, the, the seconder and things like that were... Things we went, uh, as we learned uh, went along. Um, the courses worked with plenty of hard work from staff and students, and the data we have, I believe at least, shows that. Um, the courses are available to law enforcement via ECTEG. So, as I said, all of the um, 
courses that we've developed, the 10 courses, and actually there are, there are more of them now. It's things like Mac Forensics and things that have been developed since, um, and Advanced Mobile Forensics and things like that. Um, uh, they're all available to law enforcement. So if you're a law enforcement, you can write to um, the European Cybercrime Education um, Training um, Group, and, and they will send you the course. Okay. Um, and they've had requests from all over the world for those as well. So the, they, they do keep an eye on what, what is going out where, and they do have quite a few requests. Education versus training, I, I don't think this is an issue. I think they're quite compatible, um, personally. I think computing is one of those areas where it is quite compatible for education and training to take place at the same time. I think our, certainly our, our American friends are, are not very keen on training and education kind of being melded together. They have a very um, traditional view of education being, you know, um, about principles and theories and so on. Um, whereas uh, training tends to be, um, you know, very specific. Um, but I think you can, I think you can marry the two quite well. And I think it did it did happen here. Um, and I think most computing programs in the UK certainly do that, or otherwise we wouldn't use tools that are used in industry. They'd be, you know, you could, let's just all go and use Haskell or something. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think uh, you can do both. Um, free versus proprietary. I think this appeals largely to our developing countries as well. So South America, Africa, Indian subcontinent, I think we've had quite a lot of interest from those guys because they're free tools and they can't afford the mad license fees for NCASE and FTK or even, you know, a lot of the Windows operating systems or the hardware to run them. Um, certainly we've had, I would say, problems with, with uh, NK7, I would say, running anything, a decent sized project. And I'm not, you know, I'm not even talking the sizes we were talking of earlier. I'm talking about maybe a, a 25 gig partition or something and, and it's still taking you know over a day to run stuff on a very small um, thing and crashing and not working and breaking um, whereas we don't have anywhere near that amount of stuff with the, with the free tools. Less fragmentation so there is some agreement now about the kind of things that we're doing internationally and the right way of doing things and all those all those kind of things. I think um, even the G8 um, kind of principles that you, you may have seen um, are based on our ACPO principles as well so um, there is some um, or less fragmentation. They were cutting edge courses uh, when we developed them I mean, perhaps not as cutting edge now, but they were. They was nice because there was there were people who were um, police officers who were saying we really have a desperate need for this, and there were academics going, oh well, this is going to be the thing that's coming, and industry were going, oh well, we're already doing that. Have some of this. So it was quite nice that they, they, there was that melding of experience. Um, it was also expertise outside of your own organization. So I can quite often develop a course and be quite focused and go, oh, this is why I'm doing it. And uh, obviously I miss things and I, I don't do them as well as I, I could or, or whatever. And it's nice to have that input from outside. Not at the time, obviously. You get quite right at the time, but, um, uh, but it's, it is nice actually. Um, they've got an accredited program. Uh, University College Dublin uh, runs this and it also runs sort of a spin-off of it as well which it continues to develop itself um, and has it just for law enforcement um, and the College of Policing also their, their courses have developed out of this as well um, and contributed to um, this stuff. Networking, um, the networking for the police guys was really invaluable I would say. Um, it's been quite nice with the universities because we, we, you know, we stay in touch and we you know, putting joint bids and things like that. Um, but certainly for the police guys, it was really good because, you know, they're, they're all working in Europe. They can all bring each other and say, well, who, who would I talk to about this? How can we get moving on this? Because the internet is obviously not a, a, a bounded thing in um, uh, real life. Um, and it was funded largely externally. It was European Commission uh, money largely. I think it was 70%. Um, and then the training organizations who were doing this stuff anyway, 
contributed the rest of the money. Okay, thank you.